Hello, everyone. Uh, like I mentioned the other day, we're going to be talking more in depth about the structure of the atom. And so I thought it'd be good to refer back to this uh, virtual lab we had in chapter three, where you had to build the atom. And uh, on the screen, you can see we've got a stable, neutral oxygen atom, which basically means that the number of positive protons, eight in total, are equal to the number of negative electrons. So there's no imbalance to the charge. Just like the tape in our sticky tape lab, it's neutrally charged. It's not going to be attracted or repelled by any other charge. Okay. Uh, and so I wanted to talk a little bit about the pattern that we see with these electrons and the arrangement that the element oxygen has in the periodic table. So there's no coincidence that we've got two rings with electrons in them, and that oxygen happens to be in the second period of the periodic table. Right? So the placement of the element, if it's in the third, the fourth, or the fifth period, determines how many energy levels of electrons are going to exist around the nucleus. So that means the greatest number of rings, if this simulation went a little bit further, that an element can have is really seven. Because we've only got seven periods in the periodic table. All right. There's also no other coincidence that if we've got one, two, three, four, five, six electrons in this outermost ring, that oxygen happens to be in the sixth main group on the periodic table. We go one step further and we go and make a stable neutral fluorine atom with nine protons nine total electrons we've got one two three four five six seven in this outermost ring and fluorine is in the seventh group seventh main group on the periodic table right so we need to have a comfortable understanding of how these electrons are going to exist because when we did the sticky tape lab we talked about how these electrons are the first thing that this atom is going to come in contact with when it connects another atom. Since the nucleus is at the center, the outermost rings are the things that are going to collide and overlap first. Okay? So we've referred to these things as atoms, which essentially means that the positive and negative charges are canceled out. Well, atoms have a new term, kind of like isotopes, where an isotope is a same atom with a different mass. We're going to be calling these things ions. And that ion refers to whenever we have an atom with a particular charge. And so here, if we have one extra electron to completely fill in this outermost ring for the fluorine ion, uh, that just means that it now has an imbalance. It has more negatives than it does positives. And so we call it as having a negative one charge. Okay. I did want to reset this just to kind of support that placement on the periodic table example and so if we look at a hydrogen atom a stable hydrogen atom all right we've got one proton one electron and so in this outermost ring that has electrons in it there's only one electron and hydrogen is in the first group and since we've only got electrons in one ring of energy levels hydrogen is in the first period well if we continue further and we look at a stable lithium atom, we've got three protons, and we need to add in three electrons, but this third electron can't fit in that first energy level. And that really just has to do with the size of the circles. The second outermost circle is a larger circumference and can house more electrons, which are negatively charged and trying to repel away from each other to begin with. So this is the arrangement for a stable neutral lithium atom. And again, we've got two energy levels filled. So we're now in the second period on the periodic table. And there's only one electron in this outermost ring, which is why lithium is also in the first group. Okay? So we're really going to be focusing mostly on the electrons that exist in this outermost ring. And so if we remember that the group that the element is located in tells us how many electrons are in that outermost ring. 
a nice easy way for us to kind of quickly get to that information without having to draw out this atom simulation every single time. All right, so there's a, a image on our page of notes for today called the ions notes. It does a good job summarizing this, uh, but I'm gonna ask that as we go through these notes, you want your green periodic table out because we're gonna be adding in specific information above the groups that you're gonna write in on your periodic table, right? So the first thing I wanna point out is this term valence electrons. Valence just means outermost. So we're talking about the electrons that are in that outermost energy level or the energy level furthest from the nucleus, right? And so the pattern is pretty simple. If the element is in group one, then it's only got one valence electron, all right? So all the elements in this first group only have one valence electron. If it's over here in group five, then it's got five valence electrons in that outermost energy level, okay? If we go all the way over here to group eight, to our noble gases, most of them have eight valence electrons in their outermost energy level. The only one that doesn't follow that rule is element number two, helium. And the reason for that is that it's a small atom. It's only got two protons and two electrons. There's no way it's gonna to get to eight, All right? So helium's the only one that kind of throws that pattern out the window, but it's kind of obvious as to why it does, right? Uh, so the term an ion is simply an atom with a charge because it gained or lost electrons. Right? We're not gonna be adjusting the number of protons because that changes the chemical identity of the element. But those electrons, which are really lightweight and can be added or removed pretty easily, just like we did with the sticky tape, that's going to cause these atoms to form an ion or form a charge. Okay. So the basic rule of thumb is that all atoms want to have eight valence electrons. The maximum number of electrons that any atom can have in its outermost ring is eight. And again, if we go back to these noble gases, they get eight in that outermost dash to energy level ring. And before they can add in a ninth electron, it doesn't fit. And so if we go from neon, where we've got eight in that outermost ring, the next electron to be added for this element here, sodium, doesn't fit in that second ring. So it gets pushed to the third ring, and it now only has one electron in its outermost shell. All right, so that means that we can see a pattern emerge for these particular groups, not just with the number of valence electrons, but with the charge that they're typically going to form. All right, so if we look at group 1A again, and there's only one electron in that outermost ring, it's not going to take and add in seven electrons. It's going to get rid of that one outermost electron and have it stable inner ring act as its new valence shell. So the pattern for every element in group 1A is that it wants to lose that one valence electron. And if we get rid of one negative electron and keep the same number of protons, that means that all of group 1A is going to form an ion with a plus one charge. This is where in your periodic table, which you should have in front of you, I would like you to, right above hydrogen, write a plus one. All right, this is going to be hugely important for what we do throughout the rest of Unit 4. Okay. So then that means that the pattern for the rest of the groups follow that same logic. When we get to group 2A, they're going to lose two electrons. They're two valence electrons. And as a result, they're going to form a plus two charge. And again, right above group two, I need you to write plus two, okay? I'm gonna jump ahead a little bit and I'll explain why a little bit later, uh, but I wanted to talk about group eight, which is our noble gases over here, right? They've already got their outermost shell completely filled. Again, every atom is trying to have eight in its outermost ring. So if the noble gases already have eight filled in, they're unreactive. 
right? We talked about those being the unreactive elements, most unreactive elements on the periodic table. They don't want to lose any electrons. And they don't have room to take on any electrons. So they aren't going to form ions ever, right? But if we go one to the left of group eight, and we go to group seven, where again, we've got seven valence electrons, they're so close to that noble gas eight that they only need to take on one electron. So instead of being so far away where they give them up, they're going to be the elements on the periodic table that want to take on those extra electrons. So they're electron receivers. So for group 7A, they're going to gain one electron. And if they take on a negative electron, they form a negative one charge. Okay, so again, over group eight, we're going to write a zero. And over group seven, we're going to write a negative one. Okay. Now that you kind of have an idea of the way that these atoms behave, the rest of the pattern makes a little bit more sense. Group six that has six valence electrons, they want to gain two and are going to form a negative two charge. Group five wants to gain three and are going to form a negative three charge. And then if we go back up to group three, again, they're further away from that eight. So they're going to get rid of their electrons. They're going to lose three. And as a result of getting rid of three negative electrons, they're going to form a plus three charge. Okay. So again, we'll fill in at the top. We'll say plus three minus two, minus three. Let's get rid of my negatives. Group four is this kind of in-between stage. They've got the opportunity to take on four electrons to get to eight or get rid of their four electrons and go back down to their core arrangement. So for group four, we say that they can lose and gain four electrons. And as a result, that means that they're going to form this plus minus four. And it really comes down to what they're interacting with. If they come into contact with something that is a negative charge, they'll be positive. And if they come into contact with something that's a positive charge, they'll be negative. So right above group four, I need you to write plus minus four. Now, this is... a uh, Truly the most exciting part for me throughout the year because I get to share with you these two uh, names for ions. And so there's two types of ions that can form, either positive or negative. And the terms that we use are a cation and an anion. The origins of those names have to do uh, a lot with like batteries. If you've ever really studied batteries, there's the cathode and the anode, the positive and the negative side to a battery. Uh, and the easiest way to remember this is that cations are positive, right? Like cats have paws. Uh, you can't see this right now, but uh, your lame chemistry teacher is like pawing in the air like a cat. Uh, and I would do this if you were in my classroom right now. It's just a nice, easy way to remember that the term cation is always going to indicate a positive ion, okay? And then that means that if we have an anion, those are always going to refer to a negatively charged ion. Something that gains electrons becomes negative, and we refer to all negative ions as anions. Right? So let's do some practice problems here. It says that we're forming ions. So if we're trying to form the ion for the element calcium, we first need to locate calcium on our periodic table. And if we make it enough, find calcium here. This is in group two. A calcium atom has 20 protons, 20 electrons, and it's trying to get to the closest noble gas. Well, the closest noble gas is argon here that has 18 electrons. So if calcium has 20, it's going to get rid of two. Like we said, group two element two with its two valence electrons, so it's going to get rid of two, and it's going to form a plus two charge. So the calcium ion is calcium plus two. Okay. 
Again, if we go back to the periodic table for the next example, the element fluorine. A fluorine atom has nine protons, nine electrons, and the closest noble gas is neon with 10 protons, 10 electrons. So all elements are trying to get into that noble gas because they have and their outermost shell, and so fluorine only needs to add on one electron. Again, we say that fluorine, because it was in group seven, they like to gain one electron. So then fluorine here, we would say, is a negative one charge. Okay. Nitrogen is in group five. You locate that on your periodic table. That's the element with seven protons, seven electrons, right here. And again, the closest noble gas is three electrons away with neon and not five electrons away with helium. So nitrogen wants to add in one, two, three electrons to give it a negative three charge, which we said all elements in group five like to do. And then again, lithium, which is element three, right here on the periodic table. It's got three protons, three electrons. It's not gonna add in seven, to become like neon, it's going to get rid of an electron and have an electron arrangement like helium. So again, group one elements with their one valence electron, we said like to lose one electron. So if lithium gets rid of a negative electron, it forms a plus one charge. Okay. So one of the things that we're going to ask you to do is still be able to kind of account for all of the parts to an atom and for an ion. So in this example down here, we've got uh, a potassium ion, which we know because we see that there's a little positive charge. And then we see that same arrangement. We've got the mass number 40. And then in the bottom left corner, the atomic number 19. We have to remember that the atomic number is the same as the number of protons. But unlike our last unit's worksheet, where protons and electron numbers were the same, we're now looking at these being ions. So if potassium has got a positive charge, the number of protons can't change. We can't throw in an extra positive piece because that changes it from a potassium atom to a calcium atom. But what we can do is say that if we've got 19 positive protons, we need to have 18 negative electrons. Having one more positive subatomic particle gives it a plus one charge. Okay. And so then the last bit, the neutrons here, which have no overall charge, if this mass number is the number of protons plus neutrons, we would have to have 21 because 19 plus 21 adds up to 40. Okay. All right, so for the next example, if we've got an atomic number of nine, that means we've got nine protons. That means that because we've got nine protons in the nucleus, this has to refer to a fluorine atom. But we notice that we've got nine positive protons and 10 negative electrons. So this is actually a fluorine ion with a minus one charge. And then if we've got the atomic number of nine, we'll put that in the bottom left corner. And then if we've got nine protons and eight neutrons, we have to have a mass number of 17. For the last example, if we've got 56 protons, our atomic number has to be 56. If we've got a total number of protons and neutrons of 126, then that means we have to have 70 neutrons. And again, if this is the element with 56 protons on our periodic table, we would find that that is barium. So we can throw the mass number in the top left corner the atomic number in the bottom left corner, but we notice here we've got 56 protons and 54 electrons, so that means that this barium is actually a barium ion with a plus two charge. Okay. So there's a worksheet similar to one we've done in the past that practices more of this ion identification, and uh, give it a go, and if you have any questions, don't hesitate to email or Thank you.